Hello, everyone. Welcome to our now weekly series here at the Emily Post Institute, where we take your etiquette questions. Lizzie Post got us launched last week, and I thank her and give her a virtual high five handoff as she passes this series off to me for our our second edition of what are we calling this? The How Do I Series. The How Do I Series, which is sort of a, a Facebook version of our podcast, Awesome Etiquette, which we are so excited to be in our third year of doing. And I, I hope some of our Awesome Etiquette audience is out there and will help seed today's discussion because I'm hoping that you will ask your questions about today's topic, living with roommates and neighbors. Um, go ahead and type it in below and it'll get fed to me by our awesome uh, Taylor Downs, who's here assisting me and helping today on my first venture into this Facebook Live territory. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being with us. I'm also supposed to remind everyone that we're going to pick someone who submits a question today to receive a free copy of the 19th edition of Etiquette, which was just released a couple weeks ago. I'm a co-author on that with Lizzie Post, and we're going to give away a signed copy today for someone who submits a question on the topic of living with others, roommates, or neighbors. Um, what am I forgetting, Taylor? What else is in our housekeeping for today that I should... That's it. That's it. So without further ado, let's get to some of your questions. We have a couple questions to seed the discussion. So I'm going to start with a question about sharing common spaces. Um, the question that, that, that's going to get us launched today begins, my roommate invites friends over a lot and uses our communal spaces, living room, dining room, backyard, etc. when they're over. I don't really want to join the group, but I also don't want to be stuck in my bedroom all the time. How can I promote more equality while for using our shared space? And this is a not uncommon question. We get different versions of this question with some regularity about navigating living with others. Oftentimes there's a version of this question that is about uh, a roommate who's got a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or a significant other who's spending a lot of time at an apartment where they're not a full rent-paying resident. So this other person starts off as a casual relationship. Maybe it's a very close friend, but they start to be there with increasing frequency. And oftentimes, it's something that you can take as a compliment. It means that your home, the place that you're living, the place that you're sharing is a welcoming, inviting place that other people want to be. And that can be a bit of a double-edged sword because it can start to feel like the the distribution of of shared resources particularly the time spent in those shared spaces can start to fall fall into a territory where it's not fair where it's not equitable and where one person does feel relegated to their room or like they're being forced to participate in social activity that they're not interested in like this particular case where someone says you know I, it, it's a friend group and I just don't feel like joining them I don't want to to participate in that and I don't at the same time want to feel like I'm then relegated to the margins where I'm stuck in my own room. This is a shared house. And there are different ways that people think about the, the common spaces question. Um, when it rises to the level where it's it's becoming something that's that's a permanent situation that's not going to change. Maybe it is a significant other that does spend 50% of the time there and all of a sudden they're really drawing on house resources. Sometimes you use a different formula to think about how you pay for those common shared spaces. If one person is using them much more than someone else is using them. There is sometimes a place for really addressing that with the way that rent is divvied up or distributed among people who live at a house. And oftentimes people will take the square footage of an apartment Department and use square footage as a way to figure out what people owe and they'll take um, private space and they'll say that that is paid for proportionally by the people that are in it whereas that shared space you can divvy up on a, a per square foot basis based on the number of people that are sharing that space and if there's somebody who's there enough of the time that they're essentially using it like a resident they can be factored into that equation the other thing to do, way less serious than that, way less of, a, of an interventionist approach is to talk to a roommate about those shared spaces and to talk about ways that you can take that shared time into what I just described as private spaces, those spaces that are thought of as belonging just to one person who's contributing, so a bedroom space or even an office space that someone's paying for as part of their rent so that they're not in that shared or communal area. Setting up a schedule is oftentimes a good way to do it. Sometimes it's not about the amount of time, it's about a particular time. I come home from work at this time and I just need a half hour to get my head straight 
straight before I'm, I'm prepared to be social. And that can be another way that sometimes you can carve out uh, enough time or enough space so that people feel like their interests are being represented in the shared in the shared spaces and the distribution of that resource. A couple of things that have come up even as I've been talking about this is that it really requires communication. It requires communicating with the people that you live with. And I think that's going to be the start of a lot of my answers today is that it really depends on your ability to communicate clearly and effectively with the people that you live with because that's going to be the, the source for resolving a lot of difficult situations. So Lizzie Post wrote a great book a little while ago um, called How Do You Work This Life Thing? And it was really geared for and targeted toward people that were newly independent, that stage in life where you're leaving school and setting off on your own for the first time. This book is almost 10 years old now. I can't believe that. But she introduced a concept in it that I found so useful when I first read it. And she introduced it in the context of negotiating, talking with roommates, people that you live with, and having really positive relationships with those people. And she introduced the idea of the three C's, and that's communication, compromise, and commitment. And I, I still think about the three C's to this day, 10 years later, when I'm giving advice in this territory. That first C, communication, I was just talking about being fundamental. The other two C's, for me, were less intuitive, but were really insightful. The, the compromise C, that if you're going to open a discussion about anything with someone, that you have to be prepared for them to have a perspective that might not be exactly your perspective, might not align with your perspective, or might, um, might involve thinking in a way that you're not at the moment. And your willingness to compromise as well as communicate is a really important part of living well with others. And then her third C was commitment. It was about once you've balanced your communication, your ability to express and articulate your needs, desires, wishes, and your ability to understand where someone else is coming from and integrate that into a solution, that compromise component, that you're able to commit yourself to whatever whatever resolution you are able to work out with your with the people that you're living with through that communication and that compromise that your commitment to keeping your word your ability to to live with integrity and honesty um, in regards to the things that you've said the commitments that you've made is really important is an important part of of making that communication and that compromise really meaningful in the relationship so those three C's I think are important communication compromise and commitment and I think sharing uh, common spaces is a great place to start to test those communication skills. It's definitely a place those skills are put to the test, but also your ability to compromise, that these are shared spaces, and you, uh, it's important to remember that as well whenever you're negotiating. Um, that's a long answer to the first question. I want to leave time to tackle some other areas and topics as well. I'm a talker. Lizzie and I sit around and talk all the time. And part of the idea of these Facebook Live chats is to, to invite you into the heart of the Emily Post Institute to participate in those conversations, those same conversations that we have on the Awesome Etiquette podcast, and that hopefully we, set, we shed some light on with our new book, Etiquette, the 19th edition. So our next question today is another roommate classic. And it begins, my roommate never pays their bills on time. I find myself constantly reminding them about the money they owe me. I don't want to be a nag, but I do need them to pay me on time. What should I do? Really tough one. This is one where that communication component is going to come into play where you set really clear expectations, where you set expectations around the time frames that you're expected to be paid and what the penalties or faults or defaults are if you don't pay on time. I am guessing that if you're the one responsible for collecting money that goes to a landlord, if that money's not paying on time, there's some sort of system in place where late fees are assessed. And I don't think that it's the responsibility of the person who's making that payment to the landlord or to the property management company or whoever it is to cover those types of costs. So make those costs explicit, make them clear to the other people that are contributing or chipping in. And then it's really reasonable to pass those costs on to the people who are late with their payments for whatever for whatever the reason is. It's it's up to all of us to to make our commitments, to make our time commitments and then to meet those contracts. Now, the, the other point that I think is really worth mentioning here is that there's a lot of work that goes into the organizing of, of, of any situation. Management itself is work. And if you're the person who's managing the finances for a shared living situation, that's a 
burden. That's a certain amount of work that you're taking on for yourself. And another way that you can start to share um, the responsibility around paying on time is to start to share some of that management, some of that responsibility, that actual burden for organizing. And sometimes that, that task falls on the person who's the best capable of, of performing that task, the person who's best capable of managing um, that situation. But sometimes sharing that work is another important part of sharing the responsibility in a shared living situation. It's not just about making the payment about on time, it's also the, the mental work of knowing when that deadline is and meeting it. And part of that work is communicating that deadline to the other people that you're living with, The the, however hard or firm that deadline is, carrying the weight, the anxiety of knowing that you're past a deadline like that, that's all part of the work of managing a shared living situation. And I, I, I like to suggest that that work is shared as well as just the cost, and that that's a big part of, of everybody taking responsibility and can also be a good way to get people more focused on the deadlines that everyone is really collectively responsible for meeting. Um, so there's a, a question that just came in, <clears throat> and I want to jump to it because it's, it's summertime here in Vermont, and it's something that I certainly appreciate. This question begins, hi, Dan, we have neighbors who like to have bonfires on late spring and summer nights, sometimes until after midnight. Unfortunately, the smoke means that we can't have our windows open overnight, or worse, we come home to a smoky smelling house. And if we've, left our, if we've been away and left our windows open, this is a particular problem. Is there any way to approach these neighbors and ask them to perhaps limit the nights they light fires or not, that, or not let them burn late at night? Other neighbors have also mentioned this issue to me, so I think they're creating some hard feelings overall. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the summer-themed question. Um, I am a lover of uh, summer bonfires, so I appreciate your neighbors really enjoying this particular tradition. I also appreciate your situation of, of being negatively impacted by something that they're enjoying. and. I think that you're wise to really be thinking about how you approach a neighbor, how you raise a, a question about something like this. I think that there's something I learned from my cousin Anna, Lizzie's older sister. She said, whenever you're writing about etiquette, always assume the honesty and the intelligence of the people that you're writing with. And I love to start a conversation with neighbors about a potentially difficult subject with that same frame of mind. I like to think about their goodwill and their good intent and the fact that the vast majority of rude behavior is probably unintentional. So my guess is that your neighbors are not thinking about their summer bonfires as something that's negatively impacting their neighbors. I do think that it's worth making them aware that it's negatively impacting them, particularly as you mentioned in this question, that, that it's something that other neighbors have noticed as well, and that it might be negatively impacting the way people in the neighborhood see them and feel about them. This is practically the definition of rude behavior. So, so often rude behavior is behavior that's giving offense or causing emotional harm and yet isn't so egregious that it's crossing that line where someone's guaranteed to talk to us about it. And it's what makes it difficult to combat. It's what makes it difficult to confront because it's oftentimes not so bad that you think I have to deal with this situation or it's something that people aren't telling you about, that something that you're doing, something you're responsible for and you aren't even aware of it. That That's the source of the vast majority of rude behavior. So I definitely think you wanna clue them in. You wanna talk to them, you wanna do it with the spirit of that, that broccoli on the tooth rule, that you're, you're making them aware of something that they might not otherwise be aware of that's maybe a little awkward, but that's gonna save some difficulty down the road. It's gonna save some difficulty later on. So Lizzie is the master of sample scripts. I wish she were here and I'm looking forward to the day where we get to do some of these together, where we get to sort of bat these uh, questions around a little bit back and forth and come up with some, some really practical and useful sample scripts. I think that priming someone for a difficult conversation is always important. You want to do it in private, you want to do it at a time when both people are feeling pretty good, and you can always prime them by asking permission. Hi, you know, there's something that I've been wanting to talk to you about. Is now a good time? And then you get their buy-in. Yeah, sure, no problem. I haven't seen you in a while. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. Summer's here, and there's something that's been going on that I wanted to let you know about some sample script language that's often helpful for these difficult conversations. If the shoe were on the other foot, I'd hope that you would feel comfortable talking to me about something like this. Great way to indicate that, that, that you really are mostly interested in the communication. 
Um, you know, there's something that you might not be aware of. Show some respect for their intelligence, their integrity, that they might not be doing this if they were aware it was negatively affecting other people. When you have bonfires late at night, we can smell the smoke and we have to shut our upstairs windows or the house starts smelling really smoky. That alone might be enough to clue them into paying some attention to how they build their fire. Believe it or not, just a little bit more dry wood, a little bit less wet yard scraps, it might smoke a lot less. That might not be enough to fix the problem. There might be a different location. It might be that they're able to um, do the fire a little bit earlier in the day when you're not home. Now, m maybe not. There, there might be some, you've now introduced communication, some territory in that compromise area that's gonna be the, the tricky part of this negotiation. Oftentimes the solution isn't necessarily one that you're both gonna come back and forth and agree on, but just being aware of the fact that what they're doing is negatively impacting and how it's negatively impacting the neighbors might help them regulate their behavior just enough to make it less of an intrusion or less of an inconvenience. It might be the hour, they might be able to just be a little quieter at the fire, particularly later at night. Um, like I say, it might just even be about the, the particular types of fuel that they're burning, how big a fire they're, they're indulging in, or what hours that they're doing it at. Etiquette is tricky territory. We often say safety trumps etiquette, and it's not always true that you're going to have the standing or the ground to dictate what someone else does. You can tell them about how what they're doing impacts and affects you. You can make requests, but oftentimes what someone's doing on their own property, as long as it's not in violation of neighborhood um, ordinances, city laws, or condominium association, um, or homeowner association, the uh, restrictions, it might not be something that you're actually able to, to change, but you can let people know, you can do it in a respectful and clear way so that they can make informed decisions. And I do think you're in the territory where that's reasonable to do here. If Lizzie were here, she'd have some great snarky comment about how you could build an even bigger bonfire on your property and trump their bonfire. and. Uh, not sure exactly um, if, if I've got the, the, the wit to come up with something like that off the top of my head, but I'm sure you're going to do fine. We've got a next question here. <laughs> Dan, huge fan of the podcast. So glad that you can join us in this different medium. It's always um, nice to run into podcast listeners wherever I get to see them. My question is, how do you deal with a neighbor who allows their dog to run down the hall hallways while they're going in and out of the building or while they're walking their dog in a small nearby park? without a leash. I have a small dog and I'm often worried that their large dog may run and trample my little chihuahua when we are going out for daily walks. Thanks in advance, Justin. Hey Justin, um, thank you for the question. Thank you for submitting something. This is very much like another question that we had actually identified before this live chat and it's about neighbors and neighbors dogs. It's one of the, the trickiest areas. We get a lot of questions about this on the podcast and um, oftentimes they generate some of the most heated debate between people because people love their pets. They love their pets like they love their their families. And um, oftentimes our pets feel like members of our family. And at the same time, they, they're animals. And oftentimes the, the ways they behave are, are um, not as easy to control <laughs> as um, the behavior of the people in our lives. So uh, interactions between Families, between neighbors, between pets is a big one. Oftentimes people aren't careful with um, where their pets go to the bathroom. They have to take their pets outdoors to go to the bathroom. That, in fact, that might be the, the purpose for the walks that your neighbor is taking with this dog. And that's oftentimes a place where people meet. So I, I love to remind people that oftentimes whatever that bad etiquette finger is pointing at someone else, there are three fingers pointing right back at you. And this is a time where I, as a dog owner, like to remind myself, I've got to clean up after my dog when I take him for walks. I've got to have him on leashes, places where he's likely to encounter other dogs, even though he's a little dog like yours, a little toy poodle, not a chihuahua, but he's all of about this big, this big, smaller than a toaster. Um, but he's also got a big personality and he likes to run around, try to dominate other dogs. And I even worry about what would happen if he got into a fight with a bigger dog, a bigger dog hurt him. And then I'd be responsible for putting someone else in a situation where my dog got hurt by their dog. Okay. It's all going to be fine, but it really helps if we all take responsibility for our own pets, keep our own pets on leashes and clean up after them. Um, if your neighbor is not observing these two basic courtesies, I think it's okay to say something. I think it's, um, 
appropriate and I think it's in the spirit of, of good neighborly relations to share your concerns and to do it in a way that, again, all, all of the things we've talked about, good communication, prime them, ask permission to have the conversation, um, let them know how it negatively impacts you. You don't necessarily need to insist on a solution, but if you have a couple um, solutions that might be helpful, if the discussion does evolve in that direction, you know, if you could just keep him on a leash till he's outside the building, it would make me much more comfortable when I'm coming and going down this hallway. Just that, that, that alone might be enough for them to modify their behavior in a way that's less of a negative impact on you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for making the, the leap from that audio world to, that, to this visual world with us. It's really good to see you here. Um, our next question begins, Hi Dan, I'm about to start renting from an elderly gentleman, a friend of my grandfather. I'll be living on the top floor apartment of his childhood home through my time in law school. My grandfather has repeatedly said that it would be nice to cook this man dinner and spend time with him every once in a while as he lives alone and needs some help around the house. I'm more than happy to do it, and I genuinely enjoy his company, but I worry about how to set up a landlord-tenant relationship with this man who I only just met. How can I set boundaries for the relationship so that I do not feel as though I am working for him like a caretaker or living as a guest in his home? Kristen. I think this is um, such a thoughtful question, and you're so wise to be thinking ahead about the, the particulars of this relationship and how you're going to set appropriate boundaries as you manage this relationship. Um, I had a very similar living situation in California for many years when I was living in Southern California. I lived with the same family, and the nature of my relationship with that family changed and evolved over the course of, of staying at their house for almost eight years. Um, there was a period of time where I was living there really as a work share arrangement. And then little by little, I started to pay more rent and start to take much more of a tenant relationship as they sort of, frankly, recognized that having borders at the house was a good way um, for them to, to, to continue to live there and to, to have that be a viable home for this family as the, the couple that lived there got older and older. Hi, Chuck and Mo, if you happen to be out there watching this now. Um, Communication is the key. You want to talk clearly. If you are paying rent, if you're paying um, sort of a, a, a reasonable market rate or something close to, or even something that, that, that's reasonable, even not in, in relationship to the market, but to the two of your expectations for the cost of living there and what they should be, that's a renter relationship. And if there is a, a concrete expectation that you're doing things beyond that, you want to you wanna clarify what those duties are and what that role is very, very specifically and early on. It doesn't sound like that's the situation that you've got going on here. As far as that social interaction, I would absolutely try to put it in a box as much as possible. I would try to set it up once you know your schedule as a student um, and make it as consistent as possible. Say, you know, every two weeks on Tuesday or every week on Thursday, we're going to get together and maybe it's lunch and a game of cribbage. Maybe it's that you stop by after class and you have a cup of tea and play a hand of gin or something like that. Uh, whatever it is, um, just define it. And then, then you've really start to God, um, then you've really start to have a framework and a structure for that relationship and it both allows it to happen it'll hold you accountable and it'll also put a limit on on what that is so that you're not asking yourself every day should i go up should i offer to cook dinner should i offer to have dinner um if you start to see the relationship evolving if you find yourself offering to take him on a ride to see the ear doctor, see the eye doctor, get groceries once a week. Again, you can structure that, make those offers things that um that have a concrete that have a concrete structure to them. I I'm gonna take you to your ear doctor appointments. Maybe that happens once a month. Um that can be a really nice way to help out, to be an assist, and at the same time not have it be a general and open ended offer for help all the time. Um, keep an eye on it, be really clear, you are a student, you're going to have demands on your own time that really occupy you, and also stay flexible because oftentimes over the course of even a semester, but definitely over the course of law school, the, the amount of spare time that you have is going to change, and I definitely know that, what is it, that, that first semester, second year can really be brutal, a lot of the expectations can really start to expand, so 
Um, you might also mention that at the start. Say, boy, I'm really excited to be here, and I love our Thursday night dinners, but I'm really going to have to keep an eye on my schedule and see, see at the end of the semester if I'm still going to be able to do this. Good luck. Good luck with law school. Um, I can't believe how fast uh, Facebook Live chat can go. I, I, I warned you at the start I'm a talker and I will go on if I let myself, but I've got to wrap this up. We've got to reach a conclusion. I definitely want to remind everyone that the 19th edition of Emily Post Etiquette was out not too long ago and it's got in it. We One of the changes that we made with this edition is we've included some of that great information from Lizzie Post's earlier book about compromise, uh, communication, and commitment being essential to, to living well with others. In the, the roommate and living with others section of the new book, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. I also want to invite everyone who enjoys these chats to join us for the Awesome Etiquette podcast. It comes out weekly on Mondays. Um, and come back again, see us next week. Usually these are gonna happen on Thursday, but um, Lizzie's off, very exciting. She's, she's, she's filming in LA, she's gonna do some national TV. We'll talk about that some and how it went next week. Um, but we'll be back on Wednesday to do this again before we uh, rejoin our usual Thursday afternoon time slot. Thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to see you next time. Take care.